Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Perrin Scott and I'm a deacon and I'm so glad that you're all here with us. Restrooms are located just beyond the playground area, beside the shed. There are plenty of bottles of water under the tent out back and there are some fans as well. If you have a question or a specific need, please look for one of the deacons who are all wearing the red sash. Um, there will be a reception immediately following the service, light refreshments, yummy sweets prepared by many of the amazing bakers of GCC, and pub sing will begin 35 to 40 minutes after the reception led by Amanda Whitman under this tent. don't want to speak after that. It needs a breath. Good afternoon. Grace and peace to all of you. My name is Elisa Lacozzi, and I have the privilege and the pleasure to be the pastor to this beloved community at Guilford Community Church. It is my distinct honor, and I truly mean that, to welcome you into this beautiful outdoor sanctuary on Abenaki land, in God's creation, with the hope that it will become a sanctuary 
as we gather to remember and celebrate the lives and love of Margaret Dale and Anthony Grant Barron, better known to most of us as Tony or Tone. We celebrate their lives together because they made it abundantly clear that they couldn't even spend a week apart. Friends, as we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love, as we gather in the company and comfort of this community created here today, we are free to pour out our grief, release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that God cares, and that together we can support and hold a space for our sorrow and grief. Our grief is a holy thing, it is proof that another life has touched ours in a profound way. It is a mark of love, the mark of connection, the mark of a life well lived. We have mourned and we will continue to mourn. We have cried and we will likely still cry. We will continue to miss each of them and we will continue to miss them as a dynamic duo. <coughs> Time will move on, and we may not hurt like we do now, but then a thought or a bit of music, likely a pub song that we learned from Tony, or the smell of roses or dahlias or any number of the beautiful flowers that graced Margaret Dale's garden will remind us of them, and it'll all come back. Those moments, too, are holy. They're reminders of that connection that will never, never fully go away. It is important to hold on to that connection because it is through those memories, the memories of Margaret Dale and Tony, those memories will keep them with us. In the memory of each of them and in our memories of them together, that love and connection stay alive, and with it, a part of Tony and Margaret Dale. We will share some of those stories and memories today, perhaps a funny song that makes you cry, or a serious story that makes you smile and laugh. Hold on to those memories. Tell the stories that make you smile, the stories that make you laugh. Share the memories with people who knew them well and perhaps people who didn't know them at all. We gather here as well as online, together in all the many ways that we can as one community bound together in love, conscious of others who have died, perhaps remembering other times you have gathered to remember someone you have lost. We come to comfort and support one another in this common loss. We will rejoice also and celebrate two lives well lived in word and song. We gather here today to hear a word of hope that can, even just for one minute, drive away a bit of sorrow. We gather to laugh and to cry, to rejoice in our good fortune to have known both or one of these beautiful souls. And then we gather to commend to God, who is love, Margaret Dale and Tony's lives, with profound gratitude, not only for all that they gave, but for all the love that they left behind in this congregation, in this community, even over the pond in the global community. <laughs> May all that we share remind us of the beauty of their lives and their connection to us. And may it bring each of us some measure of comfort and peace this day. I now have to the profound <coughs> gift of introducing Rachel. One of the greatest gifts that Tony and Margaret Dale gave to me was this amazing opportunity to get to know all their children. 
We've been meeting weekly for the past three months? Three months. And I have to say that I think that there's been quite a bond that's created. And I don't know, I, I need a Monday noon meeting with you all <laughs> on my regular schedule. Um, Rachel and Jacob are going to be your master and mistress of ceremonies today. And um, you are in excellent hands. Come on up, Rachel. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. And special thanks to Elisa and Fred Brunig. I'm not sure where you are, Fred, but who have just done so much as they and worked with us over these months. And um, today wouldn't be today without their help and support. I'm just going to introduce um, this song, the next song. It's in your program, Windy Old Weather. My Jonathan started a tradition of making birthday albums for our daughter Eloise, where he would record friends and family singing, telling jokes. Um, and so this is a recording of Mom and Tony singing Windy Old Weather for an Eloise album. But a lot of you from the um, Guilford Central School community will recognize it from All School Sing. And please sing along with the chorus in the program. There's a fish celebrated in each verse and you'll hear mom give the tip if you can't remember which one comes next cod mackerel so please join Susan and Paul Dedell, who have known Mom and Tony for many, many years, are going to um, do 
Just a Closer Walk, and please join on the chorus. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong, and I'll be satisfied as long as I walk close to thee, close to thee. Please join me in the chorus. Just a closer walk with thee. If I falter, Lord, who cares? And who with me my burden shares? None but Thee, dear Lord, none but Thee. And it's just a closer walk with Thee. feeble life is o'er and time for me will be no more guide me gently safely o'er to thy shore dear Lord to thy shore just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. It's day Mom and Tony would have been married 36 years this July. Um, they were married in this church. And um, like all couples, you know, they, they had struggles. They put up with things from each other. But there was always so much love and um, a lot of laughter. <clears throat> and they really took time to delight in each other um, just that was their way of being together the last weekend before they landed in the hospital I was up and um, Tony had been going through the um, J.A. Jantz mysteries the audiobooks and so he would tell Alexa to play the next book when uh, he was ready to start a new one he, and he was starting a new one which happened to be called The A-List and he said, you know, Alexa, please play the A-list. 
And Alexa said, do you want to start a shopping list? Please go to your shopping. And he said, you know, Alexa, play the A-list by Jay Vance. If you want to do shopping, go to the shopping section. And this went on for a minute or two, and Mom and I were kind of chuckling on the side. And then finally, Tony said, you know, Alexa, I'm getting very frustrated. To which Alexa went, started playing this rock song. I'm so frustrated, I'm so frustrated. And he said, Alexa. And mom, who was chuckling, you know, leaned over to me and said, he's being very patient. But eventually she went over and leaned over and said, Alexa, play the audio book by J.A. Vance, the A-list. And then it played the book. Um, So this is a poem that just, many years ago, I read this poem and it made me think of them and I sent it to both of them. And we all chuckled about it and uh, so I'm going to share it today. Maybe Very Happy by Jack Gilbert. After she died, he was seized by a great curiosity about what it was like for her. Not that he doubted how much she loved him, but he knew that there must have been some things she had not liked. So he went to her closest friend and asked what she complained of. It's all right, he had to keep saying. I really won't mind. Until finally the friend gave in. She said, sometimes you made a noise drinking your tea if it was very hot. Now we're going to hear from Andy Davis, longtime beloved family friend, friend to Mom and Tone, of course, part of Noel Sing We Clear. And this is um, a piece he wrote for and about Tony. I thought I'd share a little memory too, just as a prelude to that. In the late 1990s, that was back before the turn of the century. Tony came to a Noel practice and shared an idea for getting the dance back into the Noel show. He was no longer step dancing by that point, which had been an important part of the finale. And he hadn't been for a number of years, and he had that twinkle in his eye. He had a good idea. He said something like, I think we could devise a way to get a sword dance into Noel Sing We Clear. He hadn't counted the number of people in the show for years. But he had been preaching for years of Noel's, quote, mission to get the dance back into Christmas. It was on a list of failed missions. So there was no question that this was an important project. We came up with a three-man dance, each one entering with two swords on our right shoulders, looking as though we each held a single sword. And out of this odd entrance came a six-sword lock rising like a miracle, and Tony would lean back at that moment and exclaim with great excitement as though beholding it for the first time, ah, the star, the star over Bethlehem. You know, mixing up so many traditions in one. (laughs) But that really was his game. In the 1999 program I found up in the file cabinet, Tony noted this as, quote, the amazing three-man sword dance. He was proud of that. I only mention this uh, as a remembrance of Tony's amazing ability to keep telling the story in new ways, despite his changing circumstances, which changed quite frequently over the years. The story mattered to Tony. The other brief comment I'll make is a reminder of Tony's valuing of the people who keep the traditions, maybe even more than the traditions themselves. I remember when a member of the family that kept the New Year's shooting tradition, Tony loved to say, 
I'm not surprised that the South has a tradition called shooting. Um, but one time at a, after a show, a member of the family that kept this tradition going down in Cherryville, North Carolina, showed up at one of our shows, and that was like Christmas Day to Tony. This happened many times. Of course, the Atwoods, the Marleys, the people who keep family and tradition and family and community traditions going through good times and lean times really meant the world to Tony. It's about the people. So I hope that wasn't too long. Don't give me a mic. That's very bad. <laughs> this has a chorus, you figure it out. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. In spring with mud and daffodil, the bells of Norwich ringing still, and dancers find their place by will. Good luck tossed in the fiddler's till. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. Then summer days without an end, in pub with family, neighbors, friends. This world's a garden we must tend with music, broken hearts to mend. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. In autumn, colors, wind and frost remind us of the times we lost. These ships out on the waters tossed. Our shanty man, he's paid the cost. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. The winter's dark, that precious jewel calls forth the mummers and their fool with carols feasting burning yule. Forgiveness and the poor must rule. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. Then spring again defeats the mire, and who could blame us leaping higher? A song is but our heart's desire, and friendship the truest choir. He's a man for every season, pulling the world along, singing songs for any reason. The melody sounds clear and strong. Thank you. Great to see you all here today and hi to everyone online. I'm the aforementioned Fred that uh, Rachel uh, alluded to and um, Tony liked to say, don't go more than six doors. We, Patrice and I found our dream house six doors away from Tony and Mark Dale. I've been, been there, what, 17 years now? Um, I first met Tony in the early 70s and, and Margaret Dale and her family a few years after that. And uh, music and dance was a great big part of my relationship with Tony especially. But I'm going to say something different about our, our relationship. Uh, in the same uh, era that Andy mentioned, in 1998, we had an interim pastor here at Guilford Community Church, Allison Platt. Some oh, yeah. of you may remember her. Yeah. yeah. Catherine remembers her. Um, her, sermon, her sermons often had a little 
um, one-liner that would stick with you during the week, sort of remind you of the message that she had, the topic. I used to call them little zingers. Um, the Barons and the Brunigs sat in adjacent to each other. There's a little divider line down the center of the, or divider, physical divider between the the two pews on either side of the center, and Baron sat on the right, and Brunig sat on the left. And this particular day, I was sitting right next to Tony over the divider. Now, as Andy mentioned, at that point in the progression of Tony's multiple sclerosis, he was no longer dancing, and he walked laboriously with what he called his, his stick. And, um, and he had started to sing and perform sitting down, which was a major change for him. But this one particular Sunday, Allison's quotable quote was, pain is a part of life, suffering is optional. And in that moment, sitting right next to Tony, his whole life, as I knew it, from our connection, flashed before me. From his very first learning how to Morris dance and then becoming one of the, the, big, the best, same with sword dancing, clog Morris, uh, clog, uh, sep dancing. And all, all that was slipping away, all of that physical expression of his art was slipping away from him. And I realized that I had never once heard him complain, put on a woe is me attitude, grumble about his lot in life. Surely there was pain aplenty. But he had chosen not to suffer. It obviously moved me quite a bit at the time. <laughs> and it's coming back to me right now. Um, I went home from church that day and sat down on my computer and wrote an email expressing all of this and my admiration for him and being able to live his life the way he was with that sort of that exemplary manner. It wasn't a very long message, but I poured my heart into it. Hit send. Crickets. Hours went by, days went by, weeks went by. I thought, maybe he didn't get it. Uh, should I resend it? <laughs> or maybe he got it and why well, shouldn't have said it? <laughs> well, a couple of, I think it was a couple of months later, I was talking with Margaret Dale, and it seemed like an appropriate time to, to sort of broach the subject with her. And I told her what I had done and what had happened or not happened. And he, she said, oh, I remember that. Tony, I'm going to read down what I wrote down here so I don't screw it up. Tony was so moved by what you had to say that he printed it out and taped it to his computer to have it as a reminder when he was feeling low. As, as years passed and multiple sclerosis continued to rob Tony of more and more, he soldiered on and with the same attitude. He embraced his ever-changing abilities. He inspired the actors of theater adventure program, singing with, rolling in in his chair and singing with them. He figured out new ways of performing, as Andy mentioned. He, when we together exposed barriers in many venues where Noel Sing We Clear played, he continued to be a force to be reckoned with. We are learning to live in a world without Tony and Margaret Dale. And as I age, and as undoubtedly my, will face my changing abilities, I hope that I can emulate Tony's positive approach to f life with adversity. Thanks.
this isn't in your program. Um, our wonderful neighbors, Mom and Tony's wonderful neighbors, Scott Ainsley and Barb Ackerman couldn't be here today, <clears throat> but Scott sent us something when we asked if he would contribute to the service. So this is, I'm reading in lieu of Scott. <clears throat> Barb Ackerman and I moved into the house next door to the Barrens 20 years ago. Through our kitchen windows, we looked out on Margaret Dale's garden and on her gardening. Over the years, we also watched in sympathy as they both struggled, as Tony's abilities faltered little by little, the losses they both endured were great. We were emergency contacts for them in their later years, and I often cut their grass when I cut ours just to be of use, as I still do, a substitute, I guess, for not getting to say goodbye. We loved them both, and I'd like to speak particularly of Tony here for a moment. We were both performers, tradition carriers. We shared a certain irreverence and a familiarity with what being up in the front of a room asked of us. In the face of great losses, our first instincts can be to toughen up. We get hard. We get sometimes angry. Perhaps Tony did this privately. But I watched how, in the face of unavoidable progressive losses, rather than harden, Tony softened. Perhaps he needed people in ways he had never needed them before, but it seemed to change him. He was gracious, willing to laugh, and more interested in what he still could do than what he couldn't. It was an amazement to watch. Writing tonight, I take inspiration from him, from them both, and when my own losses mount, I hope to face them as fearlessly and generously as they mostly face theirs. May peace attend them both, and peace be with you. Thank you, Scott Ainsley. Yeah, and now we're gonna hear from John Roberts, who couldn't be here today. He did, really doesn't need an introduction. Tony and I first met in 1968 when we each came to Cornell as graduate students in psychology, and each of us discovered that we weren't the only Englishman there. Well, we wound up with a couple of other friends sharing an apartment, and we discovered a mutual interest in folk music of different kinds, but we started singing together, and one of the things that we discovered we could do was English folk songs in two-part harmony with Tony singing the lead, usually, and me singing a bass harmony, usually, and that seemed to work pretty well. We started singing around and uh, singing, uh, we, we got invited to folk festivals, we got invited to all sorts of things, and had a career in folk music that lasted for 50 years. As that 50-year mark grew closer, I thought it would be a good idea for us to do a 50th anniversary concert. And so uh, we started thinking about that. Uh, as it got closer, Tony, who by then was in, in a wheelchair, he'd still, got, he'd still got more energy than I did, but it wasn't quite as much as he had before. But he was up for the idea, and gradually we put a program together. And when we did perform it, thanks to the Brattleboro Music Center in September of 2019. Tony just shone at the event. He'd always loved an audience. He loved to be in front of an audience and he shone. I was so proud of him in that concert. And that to me was the crowning thing of 50 years together. I'm going to sing you a song that we did in our early days when I was still playing guitar. We'd, uh, over the years, we pared down to a couple of concertinas and a banjo to tour. But um, this, this is one that we put on our first album. I know Livia likes this, so uh, this one's for you, Liv. Time, it is a precious thing 
time brings all things to your mind Time with all its labours, along with all its joys And this time brings all things to an end Once I had a sprig of time I thought it never would decay Until a saucy sailor He chanced upon my way And he stole away my bonny bunch of time For time it is a precious thing Time brings all things to your mind Time with all its labours along with all its joys And its time brings all things to an end This sailor he gave to me a rose I thought it never would decay He gave it to me To keep me well minded of the night He stole my bonny bunch of time For time it is a precious thing Time brings all things to your mind Time with all its labours, along with all its joys, and its time brings all things to an end. So come on, you maidens, brisk and gay, all you that flourish in your prime, beware and take care. Keep your garden fair And let no man steal your bonny bunch of time For time it is a precious thing Time brings all things to your mind Time with all its labours Along with all its joys and its time Brings all things to an end Rest in peace, Tommy So sing together
ever-turning fateful wheel must cause our ways to part and bringing untold mysteries another day will start so sing Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> We're a few days off from marking five months from when things very quickly went pear-shaped. As terrible as it's been, the last five months has also been full of gifts. The relationships Mom and Tony created in their childhoods, starting families of their own, starting careers together, finding voices as mentors and educators. Those relationships were nurtured and bound with love. Much of these past months has underscored those bonds they created. It's been a gift to be close with their community, to remember the fullness of their lives, and pursuits beyond the ups and downs of the day-to-day. -day. One thing that's kept us laughing <clears throat> is both of their sense of humor. Mom and Tony loved jokes, big and small. If Mom was telling a joke, she often couldn't finish it because she couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> this is one of her favorites. Jonathan Rose sat on a tack. Jonathan Rose. <laughs> I later met a guy at work whose name was Jonathan Rose, and I, I told him about this joke. And I told him that my mom would love to meet him and tell him herself. And I don't think he appreciated the humor. They were always incredibly supportive. For Tony, that often meant the smallest detail was important to share. And the minute you walked in the door, he'd often yell, Olivia got a haircut, or Lizzie's restaurant was really busy last night. Mom and Tony came to a museum opening in New York for a job I was on. I was trying my best to make small talk with Isabella Rossellini. And Mom walked up to us and said, I'm Jacob's mom. And Isabella said, oh, you must be very proud. And mom smiled and said, I am. It didn't matter who she was saying that to. It was just true. Growing up, the Betsy Byers book, The Lace Snail, was a favorite. If you don't know the story, a snail suddenly starts making lace and leaving a trail behind her. Several animals ask her to please make something for them, out of lace. She made a cape for a frog, a hammock for a crocodile. When a turtle asks her to make a bit of lace for her beautiful children, she says, I'm not just saying that they're beautiful because they're mine. They really are beautiful. <laughs> that was said over and over again in our house when one of them was boasting about one of us. 
Another note from Scott Ainsley, a, a good friend and neighbor of theirs and of ours, has been sending wonderful wor- words of understanding and love. <clears throat> Scott and Barb couldn't be here today, and we wanted to share an excerpt of something he Scott wrote very soon after Bon and Tony died. Scott wrote, For our neighbors, Tony and Margaret Dale Barrand, February 19th. Two great trees have fallen. The ground shudders. There's a terrific hole in the canopy overhead. Sunlight falls on patches of ground that have only felt it time out of mind. Those trees, both shaded and constrained those who have lived in their shadows. Now light falls where it hasn't. The ground under them, except for a few mosses and lichen, is bare. For the first time in living memory, it will have to get used to the sun. Thank you, Scott and Barb. I want to emphasize how proud and grateful I am for my siblings, especially during this incredible journey. Mom and Tony's commitment to relationships continues on in our relationships with one another and our communities. I know Mom and Tony would be proud and grateful as well. May they rest in peace. I'm going to introduce Steve John. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm out of order. Maggie Sheely, a very good friend of both of theirs and of all of ours. All right. I never used one of these. So. <laughs> okay. This is really for our whole family. I have little bits from everyone. Um, As many of you here, Dave and I first met Tony and Margaret Dale through dance and music. Margaret Dale and I quickly became really good friends. It turned out that our friendship with Margaret Dale and Tony included a complete set of the world's best babysitters. (laughs) Daniel and Louisa loved them. We always enjoyed our time spent at Washington Street, and Daniel, Rachel, Jacob, Elizabeth, and Olivia came to feel like really fun cousins to our kids. Margaret Dale and Tony were the super aunt and uncle. Margaret Dale made Halloween costumes and read books, and Tony told stories about someone named Albert and a lion and things like that. There was a time that we had a family dinner for each season. As all of our kids grew up and some moved away, Christmas dinner is what remained constant, Christmas Eve dinner. A time to get back together, catch up, laugh, eat roast chicken and air cake. And one year, someone started making sushi to have before dinner. Louisa continues the Washington Street tradition of making sushi on Christmas Eve in England, where she now lives with her family. Some things will go on. So from Daniel Sullivan in Sandy, Oregon, he sends this message. When I was little, Margaret Dale used to let me help pick out flower starts at Walker Farm for the garden. I loved the snapdragons. She always encouraged me to be who I was and to be happy with who I was. I saw how happy growing things made her, and now I, too, am a grower of things. When I was a little older, I would get a ride every week with Tony and Margaret Dale to Morris practice up in Marlboro. I loved it. I especially loved doing the Litchfield capers. Tony always told me to look up and keep my head high. I still try to do just that. I'm sorry not to be here with you all today. You are in my thoughts and my heart. Love, little Daniel. From Sidcup in England, Louisa sends her love to her second family. She said, if I were there, I'd sing the road to Mandalay, 
which I have a vivid memory of Tony and Margaret Dale teaching me when they were looking after me once. So here is a poem from all of us to all of you. It's a poem um, from a book of poetry by Mary Oliver that Margaret Dale gave me for my birthday one year. She said that she liked to read one of the poems each day. She recommended that. This one is called In Our Woods, Sometimes a Rare Music. Every spring, I hear the thrush singing in the glowing woods he is only passing through. His voice is deep, then he lifts it until it seems to fall from the sky. I am thrilled. I am grateful. Then, by the end of morning, he's gone. Nothing but silence out of the tree where he rested for a night. And this I find acceptable. Not enough is a poor life. But too much is, well, too much. Imagine Verdi or Mahler every day, all day. <laughs> it would exhaust anyone. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Steve John. I'm really very grateful to be included in this ceremony as we remember the lives of Margaret Dale and Tony. My wife, Winetta, and I have known Margaret Dale for over 40 years, Tony for about 35. We spent many, many an evening together and traditionally Thanksgiving and Easter at Elizabeth's restaurant for many years, as long as she's been open, COVID accepted. We had wonderful conversations, a lot of laughter, and a story or two from Tony. Um, one of Tony's favorite things was, we all tried to get together as often as we could, but with, with busy lives, sometimes it was hard to do that. So Tony would call up and say, Steve, my good man, he says, do you suppose that we could accidentally meet for dinner tonight at 5.30? <laughs> and uh, that was really cute how he pretended to accidentally meet. If you'll allow me, I'd like to put the spotlight on Margaret Dale. Margaret Dale was an exceptionally fine human being. She tended to live under the radar. And I don't know that she actually um, acknowledged how special and exceptional she was with all of her talents. She had such a loving heart. She was kind and generous and just a remarkable lady. I think in what I decided to do today in, in order to honor her was to read something. So it's entitled, I Wish You Enough. It's a true story about an encounter that two people had at an airport. And I hope that you'll make the same connection that I made. Recently, I overheard a father and a daughter in their last moments together at the airport. They had announced the departure. Standing near the security gate, they hugged and the father said, I love you and I wish you enough. The daughter replied, Dad, our life together has been more than enough. Your love is all I really needed. I wish you enough too, Dad. They kissed and the daughter left. The father walked over to the window where I was seated. Standing there, I could see he wanted and needed to cry. I tried not to intrude. 
on his privacy, but he welcomed me in by asking, did you ever say goodbye to someone knowing it would be forever? Yes, I have, I replied. Forgive me for asking, but why is this a forever goodbye? He said, I am old and she lives so far away. I have challenges ahead. And the reality is the next trip back will be for my funeral. When you were saying goodbye, I heard you say, I wish you enough. May I ask what that means? He began to smile. That's a wish that has been handed down from other generations. My parents used to say it to everyone. He paused a moment and looked up as if trying to remember it in detail, and he smiled even more. When we said, I wish you enough, we were wanting the other person to have a life filled with just enough good things to sustain them. Then turning toward me, he shared the following, as if he were reciting it from memory. I wish you enough sun to keep your attitude bright, no matter how gray the day may appear. I wish you enough rain to appreciate the sun even more. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive and everlasting. I wish you enough pain so that even the smallest of joys in life may be bigger. I wish you enough gain to satisfy your wanting. I wish you enough loss to appreciate all that you possess. I wish you enough hellos to get you through the final goodbye. Then he began to cry and walk away. They say it takes a minute to find a special person, an hour to appreciate them, a day to love them, but then an entire life to forget them. Margaret Dale, we wish you enough because you were enough. May you and Tony rest in peace. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Nancy Detra, and I taught first grade with Margaret Dale for a lot of years. I was the paraeducator in her classroom, and she always treated me as an integral part of the program. I loved working with her. She saw my artistic interests as a valuable addition to what we were providing for the children. She even joked that I got to do all the fun projects <laughs> while she did the math. <laughs> Actually, she loved math. She loved discovering how different kids began to grasp math concepts. But she didn't love the increasing emphasis on top-down curriculum and rote testing that were limiting the scope of elementary education. Her goals in teaching were to create a space where her students felt safe and valued and to encourage their natural curiosity. She brought to her work a special quiet patience and an ability to deeply listen to and respect the needs and the joys of children. After retiring from Guilford School, she co-taught in the Art in the Neighborhood program in Brattleboro. She was able to spot the child who needed help among the hubbub of a busy art room. I know she loved her final teaching very much. We did go over fairly often to Michael's in Keene um, to get things that the kids would really enjoy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we, we kind of bought them for us. 
We also recycled everything, and I'm thinking that maybe there's toilet paper rolls still at the house if you don't want them. <laughs> I'm also going to read a statement from Molly Burke, the founder and director of Heart in the Neighborhood. She says, I am so sorry I can't be with you today. Nancy has agreed to read this on my behalf. Margaret Dale started working with Art in the Neighborhood as a volunteer assistant about seven years ago. I quickly realized what an asset she was and hired her on as an official staff member. She became such an important part of our program. Not only did she have so many wonderful ideas to contribute, she also, as we all know, had a special way of relating to children. The kids we work with have many challenges related to poverty, substance abuse, family incarceration, and more. They benefited so much from Margaret Dale's compassion and deep understanding. Margaret Dale was also the connector for our organization. She worked in all three of our communities, each one with a separate teacher, as she, but she went to all of them and assisted. As such, she provided information and consistency across all our programs. We all miss her terribly. She was a uniquely talented teacher and person. I will be thinking of you all today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan Dedell. Um, and although I met Tony before I met Margaret Dale, I met Tony a month after I moved to Vermont um, at a party at Steve Mandel's house. Um, it's Margaret Dale I want to talk about just briefly and maybe give you a little insight into Margaret Dale as a musician. Um, I had the great privilege of accompanying Margaret Dale on a, on a musical journey that lasted over 25 years together. Um, she bought some piano lessons for Tony, birthday or Christmas sometime, uh, with me. And I remember Tony coming to my house, and we had a couple of lessons, and it was great fun, but it wasn't going anywhere. Um, so we wound up spending some of the lessons just, you know, jamming on hymns or Irish songs or something. And after a while, Tony said, I think Margaret Dale should do this. Um, and I thought that was a great idea. So... For the next 25 years or so, I saw Margaret Dale once a week, every week. Even during the pandemic, we Zoomed. Um, and what a privilege that was. And one of the things I want to say about Margaret Dale as a musician is that she had so much to offer. And part of my work with her was just to allow her to grasp that and say that honestly and not compare herself to anybody else but just to own her own remarkable and beautiful musicianship. What a lyrical gift she had. What an intellectual curiosity she possessed. She would go home and talk to Tony about a Bach bourre and compare it to what a traditional music bourre was and send me information about all of that. Um, she had a special love for Bach, which is what I'm going to play for you today. And... Um, just want to say one of the first piano lessons, the first piano lesson that Margaret Dale had, she came in and she played a piece of Bach for me. And it was one of the small minuets, and she played it absolutely perfectly. Note perfect, but very soft. Very soft and very carefully. And I said, Margaret Dale, my goal for you is to have you play as loud as possible and make a lot of mistakes. So um, we got to the loud part. She never did make very many mistakes. Um, so this is from Margaret Dale. We talked about teaching a lot. And one of the things that we both agreed is that our students teach us as much as we teach them. So um, maybe I taught Margaret Dale to play louder. But Margaret Dale taught me about generosity, kindness, and loving. It's a box Sarah Bond. 
Hello, everyone. It uh, fills my heart to see so many faces and fans <laughs> uh, to be together under this tent and outside the tent as well. Um, my name is Susan Hesse. Margaret Dale was my friend for more than half my life. And I met her the first day that I uh, had a job in the schools in Putney, uh, low these many years ago. And when I was asked to speak today, I thought, oh, can I possibly do this? There's so much. And I sat myself down with a pad and a piece of paper and a pencil and started to write. And then I thought, no. I can't. Uh, uh. I got out my computer and I started typing and oh, that didn't really work either. And I thought, let's, let's just slow down. And so I got out another piece of paper in the color I think of as Margaret Dale blue. <laughs> and this has been up in the third floor of our house for some little time and was poking out of a shelf, and the edges have been bleached just a little bit by the sun. And I thought, oh, she would like that. I'm on to something here. And so I got out more paper, this time without lines, and I just started jotting things down here and there and here and there, and then I thought, I need something else. What? 
I know just what it is. I need scissors and a glue stick. <laughs> this is going to work. And so I thought and thought and jotted and jotted and cut up. And then I was tired, so I put everything away in my, my wonderful bag that an, some old short friends of mine gave me. And tucked it away, got up the next day, and cut up my pieces of paper with my pink scissors and started shuffling them around on the table and changing the order they were in and cutting them up into smaller pieces and then it all started to fall together. I remembered many of the things that Margaret Dale taught me and shared with me I am kind of a speedy person. I'm a wordy person. And she taught me to just take a minute. Think first, then move. And in teaching me that, she gave me a great deal of kindness because she showed me that even though I was getting on in years, even way back then, that there was a lot to learn, and that it was a kindness to be with someone you trusted, you felt safe with, who could give you ideas to explore. And she also, like me, was open to surprise. She loved surprise. There were times when it came up behind us that weren't as much fun, but it was wonderful to see a new way a new thing. And we talked a lot about what are the tools that let us make sense of the world. There are the screwdrivers. There are the chainsaws. There are the cars. There are the spoons, despite its simple shape, a highly refined tool. But there are also the tools that don't have a physical presence. And we loved those tools. She taught me many languages. She taught me many ways to encourage curiosity as a way of being in the world. To think a lot about making questions and how learning and wondering is a recursive process. I wonder this, I'll do that. Oh, now I have to wonder that in a new way, oh. And we talked a lot about that word, wonder. All the different things that it can mean. I wonder, I'm wonderstruck. Oh, wonderful. She was a very sensory person. And we talked a lot about the different senses and how we could use them to teach our kids together. We talked about seeing. We talked about science eyes. And we talked about the eyes of the heart. We talked about hearing, but also about silence, which in its own way is hearing just like the space between notes in music. She made music by herself when she didn't realize you were in the room, coming into the room, she would be humming quietly. She played music with her students. She sang with her kids. She sang with elders and youngers and elders and youngers together. Movement was another thing we talked about a lot because, oh, if I had just been allowed to get up out of one of those rows and columns of desks in the 1950s and move around a little bit in school, everything would have been different. And she knew that so much learning happens 
by doing, by touching, by making, by trying. And when she moved, if she was walking next to a kid, she automatically, without thinking, changed her pace and the length of her stride to make it comfortable for her partner of the moment. I think about taste, the delicacies from her garden, and the way it felt to pick each little thing, <laughs> just blow off the dirt. And, <laughs> and of course, touch. Whether it was fabric or paper, or gentle, quiet fingers in the soil, moving a little rock to the side, not throwing it away, just not right there, please. And the impossibly soft feeling of the tips of a rabbit's ears. All of these things were more ways, they are more ways, and something that she gave to so many people was that moment, that light of discovery and understanding and curiosity in a child's eyes, in an adult's eyes, in my eyes many, many times. And she could put the pieces together, whether it was fabric into a quilt, whether it was changing the rules up a little bit and making a quilt out of paper. It was always a sense not of practice makes perfect, but practice makes progress, that there's always more to learn, that you're never done, never done, never done. And there's so much that we will not lose. We'll see a leaf move and know that we're seeing the moving air that was invisible before. We'll smell a beautiful flower. We'll eat that perfectly ripe peach. And if we're lucky, we'll touch a rabbit's ears and we'll see Margaret Dale Blue. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I'm Kari Smith, and I'm terrified of microphones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was thinking about what could I possibly pull down out of the sky to, to say, share here about Margaret Dale and Tony. So I'm just going to do a little bit for each of them and then talk about them as a couple. But I brought the lace snail, Margaret Dale. Um, um, well, let me just do this. This is like, I also have Margaret Dale blue squares inside to remind me what I wanted to say. Once a snail was on her way to the pond when she suddenly began to leave a trail of silken white lace behind. The bugs were the first to notice. They said, look what the snail's doing. And hey, the snail's making lace. And how do you do that, snail? The snail stopped. She looked. She said quietly, I don't know how I move. I don't know how I breathe. And I don't know how I make lace. She continued on her way. It's just the way life is, I think. The bugs ran after her, crying, listen, make us something here. The snail stopped again. She looked them over one by one. She nodded. You deserve lace as much as anybody. And she made lace circles for the bugs, circles as light as the wind. The bugs cried, hey, these things float. And look at me, you guys. And woo-wee, I'm a bird. Below, the snail went quietly on her way leaving a trail of silk and white lace behind. And I'm going to skip a little bit to just read little bits and parts. Um, she makes lace for a snake at one point, and the snake says, But how does she do this wonderful thing? The snake cried in amazement. Look at me, everybody. I'm transformed. A turtle was waiting just around the bend. I do not ask to be covered with lace, she said. The snail nodded and continued on her way. However, the snail stopped. However, the turtle continued, as a mother, I cannot help but ask for a bit of lace for my beautiful children. And I'm not saying they're beautiful just because they're mine. They really are beautiful. And a little lace for each of them? Well, it would be the answer to a mother's prayer. The snail nodded. The children deserve lace as much as anybody. And the snail made lace hats for the children, and one for the mother, too. And then she went on her way, leaving a trail of silk and white lace behind. Look at these beautiful children, the turtle cried. And I'm not saying they're beautiful just because they're mine. They really are beautiful. And I just want to read one other encounter, because this is the part that reminds me also of Tony and Margaret Dale. Um, she was, the snail, was almost there to the pond when she suddenly heard one huge word and felt the heat of one huge breath. Lace! The snail looked up. It was a hippopotamus. <laughs> I want lace! The snail pulled back into her shell a little. Am I too big for lace? The snail looked at the hippopotamus. You are big, she said. But too big? Am I too big or not too big? You deserve lace as much as anybody. And the snail made lace for the hippopotamus, heavy, strong lace for the hippopotamus's size, and light, fine lace for the hippopotamus's nature. Then she went on her way. So that, for me, speaks also to their relationship, right? Um, they were both givers of lace. Margaret Dale with, oh, so many beautiful things. 
my my son Ty, um, their godchild, will um, always, always remember the tins of meringues that came every year on his birthday. And they get divvied up across the year. So, so those meringues are actually miraculous because they are just as good a year later, right before the next birthday, as they were when they were given. Um, and so I'm going to share um, a little bit of a song, too, which is connected to this idea of both Tony and Margaret Dale being givers of lace. They gave of themselves, their love, their passion to each other, as well as to each of us. Um, and the song I'm going to share before I'm done is um, just, I'm just going to sing a little bit of it, a Kate Rusby song. And this is a part of Tony being a giver of lace. Um, because Tony and I had many drives back and forth between out here, excuse me, and Boston, and then between here and Connecticut through all of our trips that had to do with school and dance. Um, and um, so this song was something that Tony actually gave to me. It's called Bring Me a Boat. And um, the reason he gave it to me was there was a day when he called me up one morning and said, Kari, Olivia just shared this singer with me and I have to share with you. You need to hear this song. You need to hear these singers. So I was like, okay, okay. Um, and it just happened that that afternoon, um, my my partner, Paul Eric, and I were, we were waiting to learn about our our child and where our child would be in China and where we would go to become a family. And the afternoon after Tony and I had this great like conversation about Kate Rusby and singing, um, we got that call letting us know where our child would be and that we would get to go at the end of the summer. And that summer was the longest summer of my life. And I started singing this song that Tony had given because Olivia had given it to him. And it got me through that summer. And now this song also makes me think about that time between the end of January and the week later, the beginning of February. Because I don't think Tony would have left unless he had to. So he crossed over and he's on the other side. And then Margaret Dale needed a boat. She needed to get to the other side. And I picture them, oh, I just picture them arm in arm, so happy, so full of love, and so full of love for each of us. Um, glad that we're here together, because what they would say is you, each of you, they want, they want you to know that you really are beautiful. Okay, here we go. Bring me a boat to cross to my dear. I stand here alone with my sweetheart so near. Bring me a boat to cross o'er the Tyne, for its deep murky waters parts his heart and mine. And the tide it flows on and out to the sea. If a boat I am granted, then safe let me be. Gently I'll go, for gently I'll row. As gently you breathe, as you ebb and flow. Does she know I stand each day on the shore? Does she know I'd give all to see her once more? Does he know I've wept 10,000 times o'er? And is he still waiting as he was before? And the tide it flows on and out to the sea. If a boat I am granted, then safe let me be. 
gently I'll go, for gently I'll row. As gently you breathe, as you ebb and flow. Uh, we're Keith and Becky, and for over 25 years, we've lived across the street from Tony and Margaret Dale. Uh, and like our neighbors Scott and Barbara, uh, we've watched Margaret Dale lovingly work in her garden hour after hour and had front row seats for the results. I sang with Tony for, uh, for many years, which was a profound privilege and wonderfully convenient. <laughs> I just had to wander across the street, sometimes unscheduled, unannounced, and I could sit at the piano for an hour with Tony. <clears throat> they are also surrogate grandparents to our son, Aiden, to whom they showed tremendous uh, love and generosity. And I'd like to think that we did a little service for the family, taking the pressure off for a short period of time until they were ready to, to produce an actual bloodline of grandchildren, <laughs> which were truly uh, a deep joy for, for Tony and Margaret Dale. Our family shared a lot of great meals with Tony and Margaret Dale, including Christmas dinner almost every year. And there's hardly been a day since January that we haven't looked across the street and thought of the whole in our lives. Um, we're going to try to do this song called My Old Dutch. It's a song that Tony did sometimes perform in public, but my memory is of Tony singing it at the house for Margaret Dale on a special occasion. And I think just like the combination of tenderness and humor in this song makes it very easy to imagine how much they would enjoy sharing this song together. And the chorus is, we've been together now for 40 years and it ain't been a day too much. And there ain't a lady living in the land as I'd swap for me dear old Dutch. Please help me out. I've got a gal, she's a regular out and outer. And she's a dear good old gal And I'll tell you all about her It's many years since first we met Her hair was then as black as jet It's whiter now but she don't fret Not my old gal We've been together now for 40 years And it don't Seem a day too much And there ain't a lady Living in the land As I'd swap for me dear old Dutch No, there ain't a lady Living in the land As I'd swap for me dear old Dutch I calls her Sal, but her regular name is Sarah. And you might find another gal, as you'd consider fairer. She ain't an angel, she can start a John enough to make you smart. But she's a woman, bless her heart, is my old gal. We been together now for 40 years and it don't seem a day too much and there ain't a lady living in the land as I'd swap for me dear old Dutch no there ain't a lady living in the land as I'd swap for me dear old
I sees you sell with your pretty ribbon sportin'. Many years have gone by since the days when we was courtin'. I ain't a coward, but I trust that when we part, as part we must, that death may come and take me first to wait my gal. We've been together now for During the solitary days of the pandemic, um, mom started doing grandma hour, where at, for an hour each day, usually from four to five, she would Zoom with her grandkids, which were in Boston, Vermont, California, and sometimes other places. And Tony would uh, he often actually was on the screen before mom might still be getting art supplies or something. So he was uh, her trusty sidekick. And they would do art projects and read. And sometimes the kids would just run around. And I'd walk by the screen and be like, Ma, where is everyone? She's like, oh, Grant's getting a rock. And Eloise is. Um, but they always closed out Grandma Hour with Love Grows. It turns out this is a longer song. I only knew... Um, the three lines that are in your program, which is all we're going to sing today. The, I'm hoping the grandchildren are going to lead it, and um, Andy's going to accompany us on the piano, and please join along. We'll sing it through twice. Love grows. And there are hand, um, love, gro lo love grows, love grows, one by one, two by two, and four by four. Love grows round like a circle, and comes back knocking on your front door. Wow. 
None of us truly knows what lies beyond the grave. Some of us believe that there is a life beyond this life, an encounter with the living God. Some of us experience God in the beautiful creation around us, in the rhythm of life, in the seasons. The boughs that bend into breaking in the winter will fill with sap once more and burst into young, green, fresh. They bend low a second time in summer with full leaf and blossom, and then autumn will glow red and fiery until each dying leaf makes a scarlet carpet to soften the footsteps to winter once again. So life and death are part of the unending rhythm of creation, renewal, and love. Some of us believe that this life is all we have and that we are called to live it to its fullest potential, fully human, fully alive, to bringing about a world that will leave a better than we found it. But whatever you believe about life beyond death, we can know this, that for Margaret Dale and Tony, all sickness and sorrow are ended and death itself has passed. They are now at peace from the troubles and ailments of this world and that they have entered the eternal home where all God's people gather in peace. Your love, O oh God, is stronger than death. And so we reverently, lovingly, and trustingly commend into your arms your humble servant, Margaret Dale, with thanksgiving for the life she shared with each of us. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a daughter of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of saints. And into the arms of divine love, we commend your humble servant, Tony, with thanksgiving for the life he shared with each of us. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace in the company of saints in light. Receive them both in love and peace. We pray for this. We know this in our hearts and we send them with love. Amen. Joy, health, love, and peace be, be all here in this place. By your leave we will sing concerning our King. Our King is well dressed in the silks of the best, in a ribbon so rare. No We have traveled many miles over heaven.